Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to Scale by the Bay and welcome to Twitter. My name is Yvan Cornelier. In the next 20 minutes, we're going to talk about how Twitter teaches uh, Scala internally. A little bit about myself. I started my career in the semiconductor industry, designing high-performance computing hardware, along with software to design and program it. After completing my MBA, I switched this industry into machine learning, and along the way, I had the opportunity to teach data science program in a couple of boot camps here in San Francisco. Uh, today, I'm part of uh, Twitter University, and my main responsibility as an instructor is to level up our engineering talent. So at uh, Twitter, teaching Scala is centered around three pillars. First, I'll talk about engineering frag schools, which is part of the ongoing process. Then I'll talk about our ongoing education effort and finally about our instructors. Okay, let's start with engineering five schools. It is the technical portion of the new higher orientations program on last for four days. In the first two days, we teach broad technical concept around the platforms. And the last two days on the events are quite uh, technical as we do a deep dive into a stack building a real micro service in Scala. So Scala is not the only programming language we use at Twitter. I'm not going to talk about what we do on the front end, but as you can see, we use quite extensively Java and Python in the back end as well. But still, our code is mostly Scala code. So now let's talk about what Scala means to a student in engineering five schools. And I'll start with our software engineers. So, here, I list uh, Scala's ranking in three major programming language indexes. So on Scala points to positions 29 in the Taubi index, on 20, uh, uh, 14, on 20, uh, 12 in the PyPL and Redmond indexes. So there's a lot of variance in these numbers, and I don't really know what Scala 2 ranking is, but it's certainly not in the top five, and likely not in the top 10 either. In contrast, Java and Python are constantly in the top five, if not in the top three of its rankings. So Scala is not so common into industry. Concretely, it means that we have a hard time at Twitter hiring software engineers already proficient in, in, uh, in Scala. So being pragmatic, we agreed not to overemphasize programming ex experience in Scala, and uh, rather to teach it once they decide to join us. So the other things to keep in mind is that we don't just hire software engineers. In fact, we hire for a diverse set of roles, site reliability engineers and machine learning engineers, for example. These engineers are even less likely to know Scala. However, if we take the example of machine learning engineers, they will probably use our scaling frameworks to process the big data, so they will need to write the code in Scala. Finally, we expect our uh, engineering managers to be technical and stay technical, so we will have to ramp up in Scala to some degree. So now that we're done with the student, let's talk about what we should teach. So here, I compile a short list of features that Scala offers. Wow. As you can see, there's something for everyone. Self-type, value classes, extractor, annotations, variants, context-bound, and so on. You name it. You can find pretty much anything you like in Scala. So it will take years to master a programming language, and I think you will agree with me that with Scala being such a rich language, uh, it's not exceptions to that role. But I think it's also really hard to use a feature list to teach which part of Scala we should teach. So instead, let's have a look at the code that we use internally. So I'm going to talk about the software stack in a little bit more details, but as a primer, our microservices are built on top of the Finegol and Finatra framework. Both of them are a Twitter open source project. Please check them out. So Finegol is a remote procedure call system, and Finatra built on top of Finegol, so you can construct high concurrency servers. Here in the uh, in Finatra. In the trade controller, let's have a look into the end all methods. So that method register a response called F given um, a request called method. The request is really an Apache Swift message, and the response is a function that will process on the response to that message. 
Here, in terms of uh, Scala features, the handle method is carried. It accepts one argument method and yield of functions that itself take one argument f, and so on if we consider the implicit argument. The col equal colon equal is a generalized uh, uh, type constraint. It allows you from within the type parameter method handles to constraint its type parameters. So here we're going to have args, success, and service of args and success. And the equal colon equal <coughs> args of method args mean that the type parameter args must be exactly the class args of the object methods. The two of us are very similar, and all three constraints are stored as evidence parameters which are themselves explicit. Okay? So the rest of the code is pretty straightforward. I'm going to map the relationships between the request and the response. But oops, there's a lot of uh, advanced feature play here. To be honest with you, my first reactions when I saw this code was trying to find the engineers who wrote that code and ask them what the hell they were smoking. That must have been good. So seriously, um, I would like to do a show of hands. So raise your hands if you think that uh, they went a bit overboard in writing that kind of code with all these Scala features. OK, not, not many. OK, so on the other hand, raise your hands if you think that's the type of code you think when you are having breakfast in the morning. OK, not that much either, right? A lot of people didn't decide it. OK, so uh, before I give you my take on it, Let's see how some, someone who's writing a macro service using Finatra would use that handle method in the controller. So here, let's suppose that we're writing a macro service that is a calculator. It's given the add number request, which was called method in the previous slides. The service would associate the anonymous functions on its right, or F in the previous slides. So here, the request, which again is going to be a Swift message, would be made of two fields, E and B. And the resulting uh, value, since we're doing additions, R A and GARB, would then be wrapped into a future. So I'll talk about the future a little bit later. Um, but that's basically a value that is going to be resolved in the future. So the same thing is happening for the increment um, uh, method or uh, value here, right? We are going to have. Uh, a Swift message with one argument, you're going to add one and wrap it into a future to send it back. So here, I would argue that the code in the macro service was relatively easy to write, and it was also quite clean and maintainable. So I focus, it's easy to go overboard and just cool use cool features just because you can, uh, but please don't. So in a previous example, my take is that the more complex code in the framework led to simpler code in the macro service. So now, because we have just a few framework, so in a sense, the more complex code has a small, smaller footprint into a code base, but many macro services, and therefore a larger footprint of simpler code in a code base, I think this was the right call. So now let's talk about uh, Scala-related classes that we teach in uh, engineering track schools. So Twitter stack teach new hires how to develop and deploy Twitter services. And in this class, we scaffold a new service in Scala and customize it to a need. So here, the class is now to teach Scala. But because we spend a lot of time looking and tweeting Scala code, I get many opportunities to talk more about Scala uh, what Scala basically can do for us. And I kind of see that as a top-down approach to learning Scala. Start with some existing code and analyze that. So in this class, students spend about 12 uh, hours spread over two days in this class. It looks like a lot, but in fact, we are just scratching the surface of uh, the Twitter stack. And we have, in fact, many more modules to teach engineers how to test and productize their service how they can build analytics, and so on. Again, all of that using Scala. So this approach is usually a big leap for people new to Scala, and in fact, maybe too much of a leap. So to help them prepare for that Twitter stack class, they also attend Scala Primer, 
we teach them the bare minimum to, in fact, survive uh, Twitter stack. So in this class, we start with a repl and go over different uh, constructs. And also, since many people are familiar with uh, other programming languages, like uh, Python for uh, site reliability engineers and machine learning engineers, and Java for new graduate of interns, and I think it's very beneficial to draw parallels between various languages and Scala. And this is more like a bottom-up approach to teach Scala. And students spend about three hours in that class. OK, now let's have a last look into what we do in Twitter stack. So a big focus on the onboarding week is to do asynchronous communications using futures. And wrapping your head around futures takes some time. So uh, let's suppose that, uh, let's have a look into our get method. Let's suppose that we want to retrieve something specific to a user. For example, he or her mood from the uh, database. So since we are building a service, we don't block here, so we'll return a future. The database itself is a service, and is therefore going to be non-blocking, and is also going to return a future. So once the database future is going to be resolved, the anonymous functions passed to the map method will transform that resolved value, and it's going to be the output of the resolved value from that future. So really a map on the future really hacks the map as uh, a container. Take a list, for example. You do a map on the list. You are going to transform each and every element inside it, and you're going to put things back on a list. And options works the same way. It's like a container with no elements or one element. A future works exactly the same way. So if I were to take an example since the holidays are coming up, a future is like a gift that somebody is going to give you. You open the box you know, inside. You take your gift. You do something inside it. You put back in the, back in the box and re-gift it if you didn't like the gift, which usually happened to me quite a bit. OK, so now the set method is slightly more complex. So here we're going to have two asynchronous calls. The first one, we're going to write uh, something to a database. And the database is going to return a unit. It's not going to give us uh, much more than that. It's going to raise an exception if we had an issue. But basically, beside that, if we needed something from that uh, database, for example, some kind of timestamp, we'll have to read it. So here we're going to have two asynchronous calls. On the right, we'll have to follow, the read will have to follow the right. So uh, we don't have time to go too much in details on that. But as an offline exercise, we really have two questions for you. So first, you could basically take this code here and map it here. But we don't do exactly the same. So we do a value options.get versus a dot map. Question would be, number one, why do we do this? And question number two, we are not doing a map for a first call, but we're doing a flat map. So I will on that, and we can discuss offline why we do this. It's kind of an interesting problem. OK, this is pretty much all I wanted to go over regarding uh, engineering fact schools. Upon uh, graduations, the new hires continue learning Scala on the jobs. And, but to help them, we provide them a very open-initiated style guide. And also, all the code that we ship here at Twitter for productions needs to be reviewed. So that's also happened for this. But there's more. What's more is our ongoing education program. So we have a strong culture here at Twitter for learning. And we are frequently offering many different, different types of classes. Some of these classes are about machine learning or analytics. Some are going to be about infrastructure and so on. And of course, there is something for Scala. So most of these classes are offered during business hours. We don't ask them to do that on evenings, and usually last about two hours. So for Scala, we are offering a learning pass as a series of classes that follow logical progressions. So Scala Essentials is going to uh, follow the Scala Primer. It's also uh, one of the longest classes that we have, also 12 hours spread around two days. So it's very much an uh, instructor-led type of tutorial. So while it isn't based on Martin Odeski programming Scala book, we pretty much cover in these two days the first half of the book. Scala collection is really two classes, also two hours long. And the rationale for this class is that software engineers 
write uh, code algorithms. Algorithms need data structure, and collections are uh, great building blocks for these data structures. So uh, personally, I think that knowing the syntax of a language is not enough. You also know to know about the API for these core libraries. On the advanced uh, class, dive into how collections are implemented and also focus on performance. Uh, so the Scala Essential class uh, gives students a broad overview of Scala, but doesn't focus on the specific uh, par pro uh, programming paradigm. So functional programming in Scala, as the name implies, is only the first class focusing on functional programming. And here we dive into function in great details and also how engineers should use that at Twitter. So students are then encouraged to uh, take the advanced class, Monad, uh, Functor, and Friends. And uh, that class goes into a little bit more advanced programming concept. So finally, as I mentioned earlier, Futures play a central role at Twitter to en enable high concurrency servers. And so uh, in this class, students spend a little bit uh, some time uh, getting more familiar with them. So we have more classes, uh, that, but that's pretty much the state of the mastering Scala learning path. Uh, the path is not static, and we are regularly updating it based on what we see happening in the industry. Okay? So now in... Uh, where, where did I go? Yes. So that's quite a few classes, right? So my question now, you know, is who teaching them? Uh, now let's talk about our instructors. Uh, this is going to be the last topic. I wanted to talk about. So in addition to a strong culture of learning, we also have a strong culture of uh, teaching. So my team at Twitter University is quite small. The ratio of uh, full-time instructor to engineers is about one to a thousand. Right? So uh, we don't have that many. And in fact, we are recruiting instructors. So if you are interested, let me know. So another question for me is how do I scale? Because I can't teach you know, a thousand engineers. I would not last you know, very long. Well, the good news is that <laughs> I do not have the monopoly of teaching a Twitter. We expect all Twitter engineers to teach to some degree. So as uh, an instructor, a full-time instructor, so in addition to teach, I motivate and coach my coworkers to teach and make sure that they are rewarded when they do. So besides scale and other reasons to have them teach is that because we have a large custom built infrastructure, you want, you want to learn from your peers who happens to be experts at the thing they do and the things that you need to learn. And this also ensures that your coding practices, as your coding practices change, you teach your latest or best idioms. What's in it for them? Well, a teaching gave them uh, an opportunity to do something a little bit different than the usuals. It also helped them to become better speakers, if you are in very interested in that. We do have a Toastmaster club, but it's a great way to kind of complement that. Finally, it gave them greater visibility, and that's always a good thing if you want to be considered for a promotion. Right, so now let's wrap things up. So first, the majority of the code should use a reasonable subset of Scala. That code then become idiomatic code for your companies. Of course, they should have exceptions, but for exceptional cases. Second, no two people learn exactly the same way. Maximize the learning opportunities by presenting things a different ways. It's also one reason why we have different instructors. Finally, it's only by teaching, the over, uh, teaching to others that really know if you get it in the first place. So incite your peers to teach. And more inter instructor teaching will also ensure that you are teaching the right things. So thank you. And now let's open for questions. <laughs> Don't be shy. Yeah. Yeah, so, for, uh, so the onboarding process for all technical people is exactly the same, th same thing. Right? So on, as part of the onboarding, uh, I mean the, the ongoing educations, it's up to them to sign up for classes. 
We, are not, we, are, we can only recommend what they should do. Uh, it's basically up to them to decide what they want to do. Yeah, it's a great question. We plan to customize things as we go along, more you know, on the onboarding side, but that's something that is in progress. Yeah? Yeah, so that's a great question. So we don't. Uh, so on the reasons we are offering uh, classes internal to Twitter is because uh, our engineers are interested in how we do it the Twitter way. Right. So uh, yeah, we don't, we don't really use kind of material from outside. We really customize it to need. So remember that uh, you know, we still have to work, right? So we offer that during business hours. So we, on, we only have a class you know, for two hours, so we kind of compress it and really you know, give what the essence is really in the Twitter way. That's a good question. Yeah? Uh, yeah, so it's totally voluntary. So when I say that we expect all Twitter engineers to teach, it doesn't mean that they need to be in front of a classroom, right? They can basically coach, uh, coach you know, peers and so on. But I would say that the hardest part is for them to kind of do it the first time. After that, it's hard to you know, keep them you know, not teach classes anymore because they get you know, a taste of it. Uh, so it's really it's difficult the first time, right? Uh, but, uh, so what we do is when we want to teach a class. So we can teach a class for which we already have materials. We can also come up with new material for a class. But so if they want to sign up for a class that we already teach, what we ask them to do is to shadow a couple of classes, kind of act as teaching assistant. Then they, at some point they feel you know, that they're ready and yeah, we usually do a good job. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah. So we don't we don't have anything open source. Uh, I know that we do have some material in our Twitter GitHub repo. I think it's quite old. Uh, let's chat online. Uh, I mean offline and uh, see what we can do about that. Okay. Julian, you have a question for me? Uh, no. Uh, to add uh, to uh, to uh, one to last question. Uh, I can give some, uh, some teaching scale at uh, Twitter, and uh, I can give some blog posts. Some post. I shared exactly what I shared in the class on my personal blog. So I can give you some address and resource. There's some amazing uh, resource online. Uh, you can have like, in the blog post, like there is somebody called Daniel Weintiger in Berlin. He has an amazing blog post and cover what we are uh, using in Twitter. Also, part of the it is not super great to share what we have in common because there is some internal libraries we are using that are not really good company. Um, so having collection of resources we can use might be even better. No, right. It is true that yeah, we definitely have a list of resources that basically point outside for what we have at Twitter. Yeah, for people who are interested. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you guys.